43 years ago. So he was a defense attorney when I was a prosecutor. We did. We did. We did. And the, the, I can be accused of loving what I did. And um, uh, it's, uh, you're through? <laughs> He's going by. <laughs> they just cut off the tape. No. I, um, but it, it, it was a different atmosphere. Do you think, or is it just us looking in a rearview mirror? I think that's actually a really good characterization. I mean, these, these developments are good in the sense of fairer to the defendant. No, no question about that. Um, the trusting of the other person and the collegiality seems to be a little bit different than it used to be. But it was a state-operated, run, favored system. Would you agree? That's why I don't want to take credit for any cases I had for that very reason. We were the home team, and the system was geared in our favor. I spent a lot of my time trying to make prosecutors understand that. Don't get a big head. You're supposed to win, not because we're keeping records on it or anything like that, but you're the one, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, decided, so don't get too full of yourself, and always listen to the other side. Um, you know, the prosecutor has the ultimate plea bargaining tool, the nolly. He's the only one in this conversation that can do that. And so it's important that they remember that. But in your side of it, it can be just as much fun and just as challenging. The reason I asked you all your caseload is you can get buried under it and it's no longer any fun. And uh, I, so that's why I was wondering. Any, anybody else? So, so Rusty, how do you argue and explain reasonable doubt? It always, it's all, I, I don't have a set pattern, uh, and a lot of it is always geared to the particular case. What I try to say is, we're not in the business of guessing people into the penitentiary. We're not in the business of thinking maybe they did it and finding them guilty. We're not in the business of saying they could have done it. Looks like maybe they did. We're in the business of recognizing that before we even consider finding somebody guilty of an offense that could ruin their life, whether they go to prison or not, be a felon the rest of their lives, being a misdemeanor defendant for any time they apply to a job for the rest of their life, before we do that, we have to be persuaded by the strongest possible conviction the same kind of conviction that we would use for all of the most important parts of our life. And if we do anything less than that, we're doing harm to our soul, to our country, to our citizens, and to the system and the world at large. Because what we have done is we have guessed somebody or thought maybe somebody into something that will have unbelievable implication for them the rest of their life. So you have to say that if you were convinced, if you were charged for something, what level of certainty would you want the people judging you to have? And then I would suggest put that level on steroids because it's that important. Anyway, I, I'm making that up as I talk right now. I don't have, a, 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 you know, I have a lot of lawyers that have something they would say, but it, a lot of it will depend upon that jury and those facts in terms of, you know, I, I might try to convince somebody that way during jury selection, uh, but I don't have a, I don't have a set, I don't have a set routine about it. I think it's so, I think, that's another thing. I think we have to remember every case and set of facts are different. So we got to be careful with the pattern that we use all the time, you know, because people aren't the same and the pattern's not the same. And I, so I'm always wanting to, to try to figure out how I'm going to approach a particular case until I, you know, get there. The federal definition of reasonable doubt, I've started trying to use that in state court without saying it's the law. Because it's pretty good. If you go look at the charge that you get on reasonable doubt, 
you know, and the federal system is pretty good. And, it, and so it, when all else fails, I would try to use that language. Anybody, anything else? Well, I really appreciate the job y'all do. It's a lot harder than mine. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, cool. No, that's cool. So, you know, y'all don't realize, thank you. And it's our way of saying thank you. No, I'm like, y'all don't realize how significant y'all's office is in the overall performance of the criminal justice system here. I mean, I grew up in an era where nobody wanted to pay defense lawyers or court-appointed lawyers. Nobody wanted to pay people to do it professionally as full-time. We had all those arguments. Um, I think Rodney Ellis gets a tremendous amount of credit, or should get a tremendous amount of credit. This has been something he's been after for years. Uh, obviously, a lot of other people were, but Rodney has been right up there more than anybody from the legislature days and everything. I remember, and he's been consistent about it. Uh, now he gets to have some sway about the subject, and you folks are about to be doubled, which I think is a really good thing. Um, when, I, when I was the prosecutor pro tem in the Michael Morton case, Rodney was there every day. He would come over for the court that day because it, what happened to a former prosecutor that kept material evidence from the defense is significant, tremendously significant period. It's of course much more significant when it did the harm of 25 years for something he didn't do. And then that prosecutor becomes a judge. And you're talking about David Weeks. David Weeks and I and Ken Anderson were all on the board of Texas District and County Attorney Association at the same time. Ken Anderson being the DA that the Michael Morton Act arose from and, uh, and then was a judge by the time we had the trial. So um, I, I, I think this office is a tremendously important addition. I'd, I'd love to see y'all more widely spread and, and more involved. I think the quality of representation uh, that, that the average defendant gets is better. And uh, it's not better than all appointed attorneys. Obviously, as y'all know here, they're appointed attorneys that do a bang-up job. And I don't want to suggest otherwise. But I think we're better served by having a professional group that do it regularly um, and aren't subject to having their fees paid by the court that they're arguing with. That's the big thing, isn't it, really? So, anyway, thank y'all for having me. Nice to see you. I can find one. That's it. I'll find one. Yeah, yeah. A lawyer I really know and respect, you said, you mentioned the Roger Clemens case. Uh -huh. The first one, where the mistrial was declared. Uh -huh. He tells me that you guys did not really object to make a big deal about what the witness said. Or maybe the USA, USA after No, it's a funny story, I'll tell you.